Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today, Dan Friedel and Jill Robbins tell us about a study involving island animals and the added risks they face. Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here are Dan and Jill. Biologists who study evolution. Have always been interested in animals that developed on islands. In some situations, animals on islands changed over time, and came to look very different from the same species that lived on the mainland. The experts point to animals such as the dwarf elephant that once lived on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. The animal is now extinct. When it lived, however, it was only the size of a small horse. Elephants that live today, in Africa and Asia, are much larger than that. In the West Indies, researchers found a giant rodent that looked like a rat. However. It was about the same size as an American black bear. Rats are, of course, many times smaller than a bear. Evolutionary experts came to call this phenomenon the island effect. They used this term to describe the fact that animals who normally have small bodies upsize on an island. While the opposite is true for animals who usually have large bodies, the island effect produces odd-sized animals because large animals require more food than small animals. On an island, there is a limited amount of food. As a result, larger animals become smaller over generations, in order to survive with lower food intake. For small animals, there is not as much risk from predators on an island, so they often grow larger. Recently, researchers released their findings about 1,231 existing animals and 350 extinct ones that represent 23 million years of life. They found that animals on islands were more at risk of extinction. Compared to their relatives on the mainland, the arrival of human settlers increased the extinction risk for these odd animals. Roberto Rozzi is a paleoecologist at Martin Luther University Halle Wittenberg in Germany. He was the lead author of the study, published in the journal Science. Rozzi said he and the other researchers. Concluded that the extinction curve has become even steeper in recent decades. The researchers call islands biodiversity hotspots, even though they only make up seven percent of the Earth's land mass. They account for twenty percent of the land species. Two island countries, the Philippines and Indonesia, in Southeast Asia. Have a large number of unique animals. The Philippine island of Mindoro has a buffalo that is only twenty-one percent of the size of its mainland relatives. The spotted deer on the islands of Panay and Negros are just twenty-six percent the size of those on the mainland. Indonesia's island of Flores is also a laboratory for the island effect, which is sometimes called Foster's rule. J. Bristol Foster was an animal researcher of the 1960s. 
Flores was once home to small elephants, giant rats, and a kind of giant stork. There was even a very small human species once living on the island called Homo floresiensis that was about 106 centimeters tall. That human species was later called the hobbit, and it died out about 50,000 years ago. Katie Lyons co-authored the study. She is a paleoecologist at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. She called the island animals weird and wonderful. However, she noted that many of those animals are already extinct, and of the ones that are still alive, about 50% are at risk of dying out. She and the other researchers said the speed of island extinctions started increasing 100,000 years ago. They said humans played a large part in extinctions. The report noted humans hurt the ecosystem that supported the unique animals, hunted them, destroyed their living spaces, and brought disease and unwanted invasive species. Even a species that came before humans, Homo erectus, hurt the island animals. Jonathan Chase of the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research also worked on the report. He said, The researchers cannot be 100% certain all of the extinctions came because of human involvement, because there were other things happening at the same time on the islands. However, he said, extinction rates increased dramatically after the arrival of modern humans. He pointed to the elephants on Cyprus as an example, and said they were likely overhunted. He said, before humans arrived, there may have only been a few hundred, and it didn't take long for them to disappear. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Jill Robbins. American scientists are working to develop a telescope to deploy on the moon. The telescope is designed to search for ancient radio waves that could provide important details about the early universe. The American Space Agency, NASA, and the U.S. Department of Energy are working together on the project. The telescope will be the first designed to collect data on a historical period of the universe called the Dark Ages. This period is considered important to study because it can provide new details about the formation and development of the universe. The Dark Ages period began nearly 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the explosion many scientists believe created the universe. During the Dark Ages, there were no stars or planets. In a statement announcing the project, NASA said information on the Dark Ages can only be learned through data collected from radio waves. The new telescope is specially designed to provide details on the formation of the early universe. The telescope is to be placed on what is known as the far side of the moon. This description came about because that side of the moon cannot be seen from Earth. The area does experience its own day and night cycle. The far side of the moon enjoys radio silence compared to Earth, which experiences so much radio wave traffic it is considered noise pollution. 
It offers an unusual environment that permits researchers to record sensitive radio signals. Team members say such signals cannot be captured anywhere else in near-Earth space. Anjay Slosar is a physicist with the Department of Energy's Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. He said in a statement that studying the universe is easier when collecting data from a time before the stars and planets formed. So far, we can only make predictions about earlier stages of the universe using a benchmark called the Cosmic Microwave Background, Slosar said. He noted that the new telescope would provide a new benchmark, opening the door for scientists to make further important discoveries about the universe. After touching down on the moon, the telescope's lander will turn off permanently so it does not produce any wave interference. The telescope will then deploy four three-meter-long antennas. The instrument must survive the severe conditions existing on the moon's far side. Scientists on Earth will have to wait forty days for the telescope to collect and send its first data to a satellite that can communicate with Earth. Researchers leading the project say multiple big discoveries could be made in the future with the Lunar Telescope. Radio emission from the galaxy is very bright, and our Dark Ages signal is hiding behind it, said physicist Stuart D. Bale of the University of California, Berkeley. Paul O'Connor is a scientist with Brookhaven's Instrumentation Division who is helping lead the project. The moon is easier to reach than Mars, but everything else is more challenging, he said about the operating environment on the moon. O'Connor added that removing heat and avoiding radiation are some of the main challenges faced when exploring from the moon. There's a reason only one robotic rover has landed on the moon in the last 50 years, while six went to Mars, which is 100 times farther away, O'Connor said. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, Brian Lynn joins me to talk more about this week's science report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Sure, Ashley. Thanks for having me. This week's report looks at a plan to deploy a new telescope to the moon. Developers of the instrument say it is designed to collect new data about the early universe. What exactly will this telescope be looking for? Yes, so the telescope is specially equipped to find and observe ancient radio waves. These kinds of waves, though, are very sensitive, and it takes a very quiet environment to find them. That is why the telescope is going to be deployed to the far side of the moon, which has low levels of radio wave traffic that can come from Earth or the sun. Okay, and... How can these radio waves help researchers learn more about the early universe? The team says these radio waves the telescope will search for still exist in space, even though they are left over from a period long ago known as the Dark Ages. Scientists believe this period began after the Big Bang. There were no stars or planets during the Dark Ages, and scientists say studying this period can provide valuable new information about the formation and development of our universe. So if the telescope is successfully deployed, will this be the first time scientists have been able to study these ancient radio waves? 
Yes, leaders of this project confirmed that if the new telescope lands on the moon in working order, uh, it will be able to observe radio waves from the dark ages for the very first time. Wow. Well, thanks again, Brian, for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. In 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, a truce took effect between the Allies and Germany. But not until seven months later was a treaty signed to officially end what was known as the Great War, and the war to end all wars. Shirley Griffith and Larry West. Continue the story of the peace conference following World War One. American President Woodrow Wilson was one of the chief negotiators at the conference in Paris. Throughout the early months of 1919, he struggled hard for a treaty that would result in peace with justice for all sides. Wilson demanded a treaty that provided for a new international organization. He called it the League of Nations. To Wilson, the League was more important than any other part of the treaty. Not all Americans shared Wilson's opinion. Many feared the League would take away the power of the American government to declare war and make treaties. They also agreed with the leaders of the other Allied nations. Establishing the League was less important than punishing the defeated enemy. The other major Allied leaders at the peace conference. Were Prime Minister David Lloyd George of Britain, Premier Georges Clemenceau of France, and Premier Vittorio Otto of Italy. Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and Otto understood how much Wilson wanted the League of Nations. They used this knowledge to win Wilson's approval for other parts of the peace treaty. Wilson soon learned that to get the league, he had to compromise on many issues. For example, he had to accept British and French demands to make Germany pay all war damages. The payments added up to more than three hundred thousand million dollars. Wilson also had to accept the Allied takeover of Germany's colonies. Some of Wilson's compromises violated his belief in self-determination. This was the right of all people to decide for themselves who would govern them. One compromise, for example. Gave to Japan Germany's colonial rights in the Shantung area of China. China protested the decision. It asked that control of Shantung be returned to the Chinese government. But President Wilson needed Japan's support for the League of Nations, so he accepted Japan's demand for control of Shantung. There were other violations of the policy of self-determination. These affected the people and land along the borders of several European nations. For example, three million Germans were made citizens of the new nation of Czechoslovakia. Millions of other Germans were forced into the newly formed nation of Poland. And Italy received territory that had belonged to Austria. Today, most history experts agree Woodrow Wilson was correct 
in opposing these decisions. They say Germany's loss of territory and citizens caused deep bitterness, and the bitterness helped lead to the rise of fascist dictator Adolf Hitler in the 1930s. In East Asia, Japanese control over parts of China created serious tensions. Both decisions helped plant the seeds for the bloody harvest of World War II 20 years later. But Allied leaders at the Paris Peace Conference were not looking far into the future. As one person said at the time, they divided Europe like people cutting up a tasty pie. After months of negotiations, the peace treaty was completed. The Allies gave it to a German delegation on May 7, 1919. The head of the delegation objected immediately. He said the treaty was unfair. He urged his government not to sign it. At first, Germany did not sign. The leader of the government refused and resigned in protest. But a new government was formed, and its leader signed the document at a ceremony at the palace in Versailles outside Paris. Finally, World War I was officially over. President Woodrow Wilson returned to the United States after the treaty signing ceremony. He was not completely satisfied with the treaty, yet he believed it was still valuable because it established the League of Nations. Wilson's battle for the League was only half over when the treaty was signed in Europe. He had to win approval from the United States Senate. That half of the battle would not be easy. Part of the problem was political. Wilson was a member of the Democratic Party. The Senate was controlled by the Republican Party. Also, Wilson had refused to name any important Republicans to his negotiating team at the peace conference. Part of the problem was personal. A number of senators disliked Wilson. One was Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Lodge was the powerful chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He told a friend he never expected to hate anyone as much as he hated Wilson. Wilson spoke before the Senate just two days after he returned from Europe. He urged it to approve the peace treaty. Wilson said, The united power of free nations must put a stop to aggression, and the world must be given peace. Shall we and any other free people refuse to accept this great duty? Dare we reject it and break the heart of the world? We cannot turn back. America shall show the way. The light streams upon the path ahead and nowhere else. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee began hearings on the treaty. It heard a number of people who opposed the League of Nations. They said the League would destroy the freedom and independence of the United States. The committee completed its hearings and prepared a report for the full Senate. The report said the United States should reject the treaty unless changes were made. The committee proposed almost 40 changes. The committee's report was a blow to President Wilson, both politically 
and personally. He had worked extremely hard to win Europe's support for the idea of a League of Nations. Great crowds in Paris had cheered him and his idea. Now the Senate of his own country was about to reject it. Wilson decided he must take his case out of the hands of the people's representatives. He would take the case directly to the people themselves. He would build public support for the treaty. If enough citizens supported it, he believed, the Senate could not reject it. President Wilson planned a speaking trip all across the country. His family and his doctor urged him not to go. They said he was still weak from a recent sickness. But Wilson refused the advice. He said the treaty was more important to him than his own life. The President left Washington in early September. He traveled in a special train. In city after city, he made speeches and rode in parades. He shook thousands of hands. At times, he suffered from a painful headache. But there was no time to rest. Everywhere Wilson stopped, he urged the people to support the League of Nations. It was, he said, the only hope for peace. In Boulder, Colorado, 10,000 people waited to hear him. By then, Wilson was extremely weak. He had to be helped up the steps of the building where he was to speak. He made the speech. He said he was working to honor the men who had died in the war. He said he was working for the children of the world. Wilson put all his heart and energy into his speeches. And, as his family and doctor had warned, the pressure was too great. While in Wichita, Kansas, the pain in his head became terrible. He could not speak clearly. His face seemed frozen. A blood vessel had broken in his brain. Wilson had suffered a stroke. The president was forced to return to Washington. His condition got worse every day. Soon he was unable to move. Woodrow Wilson would spend the rest of his presidency as a terribly sick man. He continued to hold on to his dreams of a League of Nations, but his dreams now filled a broken body.